Yes. I do understand uh, there's a subsequent piece he's doing for the Lancet Commission now mm -hmm. with three other papers which are sort of coming out of that. He may or may not talk about that, but Joe is really one of the research leaders. He's done, someone else referenced some of his uh, uh, meta-analyses that he was first author on as well. Um, I think one of the other great things about Joe uh, that I really thank him for is he managed to make it rain in Manchester for th three days last week, which meant that we managed, Australia managed to keep the ashes. So thank you, Joe, for that. That was good. I hope it's sunny there now. Um, so could we all welcome uh, Joe Firth? Thank you. Thank you very much, Russell, for the kind introduction. I'm glad you enjoyed the rain of Manchester. It only rains when the Australians visit. Other than that, it's always beautiful, beautiful weather. Okay, can you can you see my presentation though? I just thought I'd check yep, that before I it's start. It's perfect. Yep. Right, yeah, great, and great. It's good. Great. So thanks everybody for coming along. I can't see any of you guys. So I'm sorry I couldn't be joining you there in person. It sounds like a fantastic program, but it's a little bit far for a 20 minute talk, but I do want to come back. I know there's a lot of people there speaking who I know and work with and stuff and missing you all. So I'm looking forward to coming back hopefully for a visit at some point, but 20 minutes is probably enough of me. I get boring after that anyway. So we've got this 20 minutes now where I'm just going to talk about the um, the process that we're going through and also the research that's underpinning the update of the Lancet Psychiatry Commission on protecting physical health in mental illness. So I'll just give a most, I, I mean, a lot of people here were even involved in the original commission, so I'll not talk much about that, but just go into some of the a little overview of that and then we'll, um, yeah, and then tell you about what the type of research that's been coming out since and the avenues that have been explored for updating this and, and driving the impact. So let's go. Okay. I assume everybody here at the Equally Well Symposium, I usually do this at the psychiatry um, conferences, I guess, but everybody here will be very familiar with the saying, healthy body, healthy mind. It's something that pervades everybody's understanding of health, really. It's something that is um, well accepted by all types of health professionals and the general population. It's well supported by all types of research from every different field, really, from the physical health fields and the mental health fields and something as, as old as time. However, um, this is not the way that our healthcare systems are set up. They somehow don't really seem to take this into account. And this is a funny little cartoon, but that really paints uh, the sad picture of how a lot of people treated for mental illness or, or physical health conditions can actually feel when dealing with healthcare services. Obviously, as you can see here, it, the cartoon kind of de depicting how the, the body is, um, you know, often neglected in mental health care and then and maybe even at the expense of treating mental health. Uh, the, that's the kind of toll it takes. And then vice versa as well. A lot of people receiving treatment for physical health conditions feel like it's a, a very, obviously a very medical thing that doesn't take into account the psychological impact. So really, um, yeah, just trying to say that the basis for this idea was about protecting physical health in the original commission and, and really bringing physical health as a core component into the care of people with mental illness rather than just treating the mental illness. You know, we're treating people living with these conditions and thus we should be protecting the body and the mind. And this was the basis for the original commission, which uh, a lot of people are probably are familiar with and a lot of people also helped out with, obviously. Uh, a, a really broad team from all across the world and all different types of professions bringing together, obviously, psychiatrists, exercise physiologists, a range of allied health professionals, public health people, global health people. And it, it, was, really, it was really a big endeavor that, that came together quite nicely back in 2019. And there's, there's some other infographics and stuff online, but here's a main blueprint, so to speak, of three things, areas requiring further recognition from obviously everything that we reviewed for the commission, actions for health policy services and promising areas for future research across various different levels of, of care. And we've decided now to move forward, well, we've been asked by the, the lands themselves to kind of bring this forward and update it. So a, f a first thing that we're doing is looking at the impact of the original commission. It's been very encouraging to see that the type of impact that these things can have you know it's been used by NHS clinical commissioning groups to actually get funding to start new initiatives in mental health care exercise stuff diet stuff um, various range of different in various psychiatric hospitals and also community mental health care settings it's received a lot of research funding to really pursue the aims as you saw the the further need for research from UKRI from NHMRC a lot of people are taking these things forward um, 
And then it's been cited in a lot of public health guidelines and used by various different bodies and things like that, even as far as the Taiwanese Society of Psychiatry updating their um, integration of physical health statements on that as well. So it's been it's been good to see the impact and we're hoping to kind of look at what worked for driving the impact in these updated documents. So that's what's next. And so far, we've really been given a, uh, you know, a very open book by the Lancet, so to speak, on how we produce follow-up pieces and there's not going to be a specific limit but so far we've identified three areas to be covered by separate follow-up pieces and putting together the teams and, and the concepts of those so one is very much focused on the the like overarching the public health the public mental health approach towards integrating physical health and the care of, and the protection of physical health on a public health uh, scale so that is around really looking at our health policies and public health initiatives you know, obviously they're good for reaching the general population. That's that's how they can further effects for things like reducing alcohol intake or for things like cutting down smoking. They've been quite effective over recent years. But those public health initiatives are often quite not very inclusive and do not really reach people living with severe mental illness who probably would require those or be more at risk of those type of behaviours. So it's looking at repurposing those in various different global settings, obviously in low and middle income countries, in our high income countries where we're not we're not doing well on that either. Um, and Russell's already been helping us out with that and he's really interested in that field as well. And we've also got the like, equally well kind of counterpart to some degree of Russell, Peter Byrne in, in the UK, who's a head of public mental health here with the Royal College um, leading that. So that's that that's one area that I think really requires further attention at the minute and how we can actually adapt public health policy to at least address the needs of people living with severe mental illness and make sure our public health schemes are inclusive. The other area is the the least of my areas really looking at more like the because I'm I'm not a psychiatrist obviously and but this this is going to be updating. There's been loads of new research, loads of new drug discovery, loads of new trials looking at how we can improve prescribing to take physical health more in mind. So there was a lot on this in the original commission led by Dan Siskind, who might be there today or might not. And he's working with uh, Toby Pillinger and Fiona Cochran and, and some of the other psychiatrists who produce guidelines for a model hospital and things like that, looking at what we can be doing better in terms of prescribing and in various different settings as well, because the first commission only really focused on high income settings. And since then, we've received a lot of interesting feedback from psychiatrists working across the world who say, you know, without the access to these expensive medications, the posh ones, uh, some of those recommendations are, are not very useful. And there's different type of side effects to managing those settings as well, um, with regards to how people say manage heat, for instance. So, yeah, so, and, and then also really taking a big interest in what else we can be prescribing. People living with mental illness and diagnosed with mental health conditions or treated with psychiatric medications are obviously at much higher risk of physical health conditions, but surprisingly, they're less likely to receive the necessary medications to manage those conditions, cardioprotective medications like statins, uh, or maybe even things like semaglutide. People with severe mental illness, the diagnostic overshadowing makes them, even though they're obviously at higher risk just by the medications they're taking, less likely to receive the co-prescribing of other things that can help attenuate those effects. So looking at how we can optimize that process as well. But again, not really my my area, but I think something that can be very um, impactful. Okay. Finally, the area um, that is more my area, doing this with Simon Rosenbaum, I believe is there today, and Scott Teasdale should be there uh, as well, producing a piece on really looking at the effective implementation of physical health interventions in the context of mental health care services. This, some, this is something that's been getting a lot more attention recently, encouragingly. It's still not delivered as part of standard care globally, and especially not uh, in the UK. We, we really a lot, have a lot of enthusiasm for like monitoring people's physical health, but that obviously doesn't really change people's physical health outcomes. And a lot of the health promotions initiatives are more about just telling people how to be healthy rather than actually introducing uh, ac accessible and engaging schemes as part of standard care for helping people quit smoking, helping people um, really, you know, take up physical activity, types of physical activity they enjoy, uh, rather than just telling people to be more active, helping people address the dietary changes that might even be induced by the um, initiation of psychiatric medications, looking at these really bespoke and accessible schemes and how we can implement them in a cost-effective and clinically effective way, updating the evidence around that. So that, that's what I'll talk about really for the rest of this talk, just for the next 10 minutes. 
Um, and in the original commission, we spoke a lot about the provision of evidence-based lifestyle interventions based on the diabetes prevention program. This is something obviously developed in the general population, which is shown to be widely effective, just as effective as metformin um, in terms of actually more effective than metformin in many trials in terms of preventing the onset of diabetes and something that can also be repurposed. It's been demonstrated in a number of different settings right across the world. It's also already been demonstrated that using these evidence-based principles from the DPP, which is really, you know, you can see them all in the original commission. We've gone into great detail on that. But really what it comes down to is just providing like the level of support that people actually realistically need to like really take on effective behavior change, you know, rather than just instructing people on how to, on what a healthy lifestyle is. It's about just actually creating those changes in people's lives, usually in a group setting, usually with the input of, exercise professionals or dietitian professionals or basically just bringing physical health professionals into mental health care. And it's not just about telling the mental health staff, the psychiatrists, that they have to encourage people to be more active or eat better or whatever, because that doesn't really work. We've tried, tried those type of schemes a lot. And the more you rely on the mental health staff, not because they're not enthusiastic about it, but, you know, they're often really under-resourced services, they're understaffed anyway. And then when you put the physical health or behavior change responsibilities on those people whose expertise lays elsewhere, it's not surprising when those lifestyle interventions kind of fail. So it's about integrating physical health professionals into mental health care. And that's been demonstrated a lot to work, um, or at least especially training, you know, it, introducing the, the expertise of physical health professionals, even if it's through the mental health staff into those settings. So, um, yeah, and there's been a really good, actually, new trial on this showing just how effective lifestyle interventions can be. This, this was a very good, well-designed lifestyle intervention taking into account physical activity and diet and things like that delivered in, in um, Dutch outpatient settings. Uh, I think maybe 200 people or something like that. A big RCT published just last month. And you can see this is in terms of body weight, which is not something that we always focus on. We are more interested in the overall um you know benefits for quality of life or helping people manage their mental health condition and engaging people in meaningful activities but it's good to see that it is also really effective even in people already taking um, antipsychotic medications for reducing body weight compared to usual care so they definitely can be effective if done right some of the you might have already heard about this today probably it's been uh, I like to show this off around the world, but I, I guess I meant you guys probably know it in Sydney, the birthplace of some of the gold standard in terms of introducing exercise and diet and lifestyle into standard mental health care in their early intervention services with Jackie Curtis and Phil and Simon and Scott and Oscar and the rest of the team there who did started very small, really, just changing a meeting room into a gymnasium and i won't talk much about that but then since then the scheme has been really standardized it's been rolled out further and they've introduced all these different aspects of lifestyle and the benefits of that anyone who's interacted with that team or with those services you know can speak to the benefits of that and there's a lot of published research as well really supporting how these um these changes can have a big difference and the manual for it is now and the more details are, are now online Similarly, in the UK, there's a really nice example coming from Matt Waugh and his Live More charity, which is all just about setting up war, uh, gyms on mental health wards. Now, you see, a lot of mental health wards actually already do have gyms. And they say, they'll even say, you know, we already have a gym. No one wants to use it. But look, this is a gym. there. <laughs> look at that gym. Did you want to use that gym? Nobody, nobody in the world would want to use that gym. But basically, just using those same spaces, getting donations of equipment from local gymnasiums that might be turning stuff over or just finding really cheap stuff online. Um, they've basically got like a wish list as well of safe, effective um, equipment that you can kit out a gym with for very cheap. So they use these bags and stuff like that. And then we have Matt, who's a mental health nurse, but also trained in fitness stuff, delivering fitness sessions for the people in these um, inpatient psychiatric settings. And this has had a really tremendous effect in terms of even reducing violence in the ward. He's managed to get it going through six wards so far, and he's looking for... I think it just it's so cheap to do it can do it can do like 20 wards with 100 grand of funding and kit out 20 wards and they've got this there the permanent aspect just changing around the decor getting some new equipment in there and um, having somebody on hand who's trained in some fitness to get people going and this has been super effective um yeah and we're also interested in using these interventions not just to prevent 
mental health. Um, I mean, not just to prevent physical health comorbidities, but also prevent mental health co comorbidities and also help people manage their mental illness. And there's more and more evidence around how lifestyle interventions, which we published since our, our last Lancet Commission, really bringing together the evidence and top tier evidence as well. This review looked at 29 meta-analyses of cohort studies, 12 Mendelian random randomization studies, which is like a new epidemiological method for inferring causality from large scale population observational data using genetic um, genetic information as well. Um, other meta reviews and meta analyses. And what you can see is, again, this full reports online, but this figure really just demonstrates the amount of the, the lines and the thickness of the lines you can read at the bottom there represents like the amount of converging top tier evidence that already exists in terms of these lifestyle components and these psychi diagnosed psychiatric conditions down the middle there. And you can see there's really strong links between all of them, other than really diet, but that's um, that's just due to the lack of um, research funding and research. That, that's a really innovative field at the minute. And if you've seen the work of Felice Jack and their colleagues, these guys are really, even already this figure will be outdated because they're producing really top tier evidence for how diet is implicated in a number of psychiatric conditions. And I'm sure that that'll catch up soon in terms of, where the evidence lies, but yeah, um, really interesting to see how that develops too. Physical activity has always been my main interest and my main field, and that's got some of the most you know commonly observed links of causal relations between all of these different broad spectrum of mental health conditions. Our recent reviews on that have shown how um, you know massive massive reviews, even just looking at depressive symptoms across all conditions, uh, physical health conditions, mental health conditions, and thousands of people moderate to large effects. We know now that exercise is just as good as other first line treatments in the treatment of depressive symptoms across a broad range of contexts. Um, supervised group based, this is all supported by the evidence now, even when using MDD, moderately intense. You don't need to be training people up to be athletes or anything like that. You know, it's just about helping people be more active and engage with the types of activity they enjoy. And it doesn't really matter what types of activity they do. <laughs> Most of it lies with aerobic, most of the evidence at the minute, but the more research that comes out, we basically see whether it's sports, whether it's strength training, whether it's things like yoga, whatever it might be, the, the type doesn't really matter, but helping people to engage in these physical activities is super important to the point where it's even now recommended by the recent World Health Organization guidelines that get a little bit overlooked because, well, they call it chronic conditions or disability. It's not the terminology I'd use, but it's good to see that these mental health conditions are in rec recommended that physical activity is used in their treatment by the World Health Organization and their recent guidelines there. And just as much evidence now, the World Health Organization reckons that there's just as much evidence that physical activity is good for our minds as there is as our hearts and bodies. So as much as we're all certain that physical activity can be good for our physical health, there's just as much reason to believe it's as good for mental health across various different domains just even achieving 150 minutes a week, plus two days of strength training, which can be integrated with that. But you can, again, if people want to use these guidelines, I know that some mental health care services and people have really managed to get hold of this. The reason why I'm bringing it up is because people managed to use these guidelines of kind of leverage for initiating physical activity schemes in their, in their services. Because it's still not happening. This is a really good report produced by a different group to our team uh, back in 2019, just really, bringing together like the actual provision, not looking at what the, um, what the outcomes are, but just a provision of health behaviors in mental health care services. And we still do that despite all this evidence and despite all these guidelines and everything like that, there's nothing really happening on a, on a broad scale in terms of wide integration and common integration across basically every, even the ones like basic ones like smoking, there's not really much offered still for people with severe mental illness or early intervention services to help people quit, which is amazing that it's not more integrated into care. One way that we're doing that in Manchester, um, I think I'm running out of time actually. Yeah, should I talk about, yeah, I've got a few minutes. The, the main thing that I'm doing now in Manchester is looking at how we can use digital technologies because it's not through a lack of want why we see no integration. It's just because it's so hard to do anything in the mental health care services due to red tape, bureaucracy, and also just lack of resources. But digital tech is a good way of, of getting around this, I believe, and making things a bit more accessible for people. Right now, as we know, there's loads of investment and interest from companies, from research funders, and everything on how we can use digital apps and things like that for 
treating mental health care, uh, for treating mental health conditions. Separately to that, loads of research around how we can use digital health to promote health and fitness in the general population. But there's not really a lot looking at how we can use these health and fitness technologies and physical health technologies for people with mental illness, which ultimately will just lead to the same things that we've seen in public health initiatives and everything else where we see great progress in using digital tech for improving the health of the general population and then excluding those who actually uh, would need it most from the most disadvantaged settings. So we've been doing a lot about seeing how people want to use these technologies, doing a lot of data gathering. Um, look, at, we've done a study of 500 young people, uh, like a perspective gathering exercise, going through different types of apps, health tracking apps, health coaching apps, home workout apps. Uh, the results of that will be coming out soon, looking at how people want to use these technologies to support their physical health. And it's amazing just from looking at the results already, how many young people treated for mental illness are already trying to use these technologies. They're trying to do their health tracking. They're using YouTube videos, keep fit stuff. But, you know, God knows if they're looking at something that's actually useful or just some like fitness influencer garbage. It's, it's, there's, there is a lot of incentive to, um, to use this among the young people. It's not everybody, obviously, but a surprising proportion. Um, but yet we don't really have anything to offer in terms of that yet. So we're also doing a lot around clinical implementation studies and what the clinicians have need. This is published now actually online in early intervention in psychiatry journal, uh, looking at what clinicians think they need to integrate digital physical health interventions into their care offerings as well. And really that's a lot about making sure that the clinicians feel upskilled in these technologies and making sure they know what is evidence-based and, and what is, you know, garbage <laughs> uh, as well. We're doing some trials. We're trialing out a smoking app, which is really, um, the, really widely offered through the UK already. And the best part of this, we trialed out a few different ones with young people with men mental health conditions, but the best part is um, the, the, the clinic where people can access in real time uh, support from a trained smoking cessation advisor any time of day when they feel like they're going to relapse. And just to give simple, and it's a real person, there is a robot as well, but there's a real person that people can talk to to just get some simple advice or inspiration to stay with it. Uh, and there's also like this dragon app, which some people have been having fun with, basically where when you quit smoking, you hash your dragon. You don't have to do this as part of the trial. You can choose a <laughs> take on the dragon on or not but you actually dragon on the day you quit and the longer you quit the the stronger the dragon gets and um yeah and you can engage in games with the dragons for distraction and things like that so that's going quite well in terms of health and fitness stuff we tried out a lot of different fitness apps the nike fitness app the uh the fitbit premium app we we gave we gave them uh to to our ppi groups who were really you know supportive of the technology but even with the best tech if you leave people with it, no one's really interested in doing it by themselves for weeks and weeks and weeks, or even a week. Within a few days, most people will just drop off even the most interesting tech. So we've gone in a slightly different direction for this trial that's just starting at the minute. Um, basically bringing live exercise classes through the early intervention services. So delivered online by our team. And it's really easy to deliver because we just live stream a Fitbit premium workout that we all select as a group, whatever people want to do. Uh, 20, 30 minutes of, of fitness stuff, 10, 15 minutes talking about a healthy lifestyle and what we want to do in the next session. That uh, The service user just gets a link, text to them through the phone, and they click it, brings it up, you know, Zoom, just like today, and they're there at a certain time every every week. Well, they get twice a week, supervised sessions and a group discussion as well. People can leave the cameras on join it um, and join in, or they can just leave the cameras off and do it at home, or even skip the session entirely and they'll get a recording of the workout emailed to them. So we've again, we've done a few test sessions and they, those went quite well. So I think this could be the type of way, you know, you're keeping that person aspect, that social aspect, even in the digital world, could be a better way than just prescribing apps. But we do give people a Fitbit as well to help track their own activity and just as a bit of incentive. So yeah, I'm not sure if I've even gone over time there. Sorry if so. Just whittling away to myself, can't even see anybody or anything like that. I hope people have heard it. Thanks, everybody. That's the end of my uh, presentation. And I'm not sure if we do questions or, or we have a panel at the end or anything like yeah, that. Uh, thanks. No, sorry, Joe, everyone's left. It was too boring. Uh, <laughs> no, no, everyone's glued to their seats here. No, literally, at this time of day. Um, we don't have any time for questions, but I just want to make a comment. It's like, wow. Um, you know, when we think about, we've talked about this, when you think about, 
you know, you talked about the difficulty of adopting things. And a lot of this, there is a bit of lag between research and guidelines and practice. But we also think about the authorising environment. How do you get credibility in your service? And part of that is getting the chief executive. Part of that is getting the place-based expertise. A lot of that is getting consumer and lived experience experts. But the other part is having the robust evidence, you know, the bulletproof evidence. And I think really this, this contribution you're making in the UK and internationally is outstanding and such a great contribution in terms of strengthening the authorising environment. So when people hear that the, the change, the people on the cusp of that change in this room here try to advance practice, they've got your research evidence and the research evidence that you're bringing to us today as part of that authorising environment. So the evidence is here, it's bulletproof, this is what we need to do. So on behalf of us all here, I'd like us all to thank uh, Joe Firth. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. I'll just uh, stop sharing Thanks, now. Joe. And I know you can't see, but everyone's standing up applauding as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah great. <laughs> Thanks so thank much, Thank you, guys. Joe. Cheers. Okay. See you soon. Bye. Um, the next